Welcome to the second in a three-part speaker series on climate change and infectious diseases, uh, jointly hosted by the University of Toronto's Institute for Pandemics, Climate Positive Energy, and the Emerging and Pandemic uh, Infections Consortium. Today's topic is climate change, pandemic risks, and population health. My name is David Fisman. I'm a physician epidemiologist based at the Dalalana School of Public Health. And I co-lead the readiness stream at the University of Toronto Institute for Pandemics. Before I introduce our invited speaker, I'd like to acknowledge that this land on which the University of Toronto operates for thousands of years has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. A couple of housekeeping items. Please use the Q&A function to ask any questions. Given the length of time of the seminar, we may not get to every question asked. The webinar is being recorded, and it will be made available by the three host institutes. And now it's a tremendous pleasure um, just go off script for a moment here. Um, I've known uh, our, our invited speaker for a long time. I've worked with her for a long time, and I think she is a walking, talking embodiment of the ideal of one health um, in, in Canada. Uh, it's, 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 it's a tremendous uh, pleasure to introduce her. Our invited speaker, as you all know, is Dr. Amy Greer. She holds a Canada Research Chair in Population Disease Modeling and is an Associate Professor and Director of the Graduate Program in the Department of Population Medicine at University of Guelph. Dr. Greer's research program explores the introduction, spread, dynamics, and control of infectious diseases in populations, uh, added brackets, human and animal populations, and overlap. She's an outbreak scientist who communicates evidence to inform decisions who orients her research investigations into pra uh, to practical application and works at the interface of research, public, public health, and veterinary health practice and education. And without further ado, I'll, I'll turn it over to Dr. Greer. Thank you so much. I'm going to get my screen up here. Slow to load. All right. Um, thank you so much for the invitation. This is a wonderful seminar series, and uh, it's a real privilege to have been asked to give kind of the opening talk to set the stage for the panel discussion today. So, you know, when we teach epidemiology and we, we start working with graduate students, one of the first things that we talk to students about is something called the epidemiological triad. And when we're talking about infectious diseases, what this means is we want to think about three components. We want to think about hosts. That could be humans, that could be animals, could be plants. We want to think about agent, so virus, bacteria, parasite, fungus. And we also want to think about environment, so the environment in which any sort of interactions between these two occur. And when we think about this triad or this triangle where each of the components kind of are at the uh, tip of the triangle, it sort of suggests that they have equal influence. And I kind of like to present it a little bit differently, which is thinking that, you know, the agent and the host are variables that are dependent on each other and also on the environment. So what does the environment really have to do with this? So when we think about environment in a public health context, we often Think of it as location or geography. Uh, you know, the, the host and the pathogen interact in a hospital setting or in a school setting or in a home. That's where the infection process happens. We don't typically think about ecology and nature and weather, but in the context of emerging infectious diseases, especially those with pandemic potential, which is really the focus of um, the seminar series, we really need to think very broadly about that environment piece and the inclusion of climate and nature. Humans are currently engaged in lots of behaviors. Uh, so, you know, people are engaged in a lot of behaviors um, and these behaviors lead to things like the global loss of biodiversity, deforestation, you know, we're engaged in development of land and the extraction of natural resources. 
And at the same time, climate change, which is also caused by human behavior, is resulting in quite dramatic changes to the sorts of environmental patterns we see. Uh, we see extreme heat events, we see changes to the patterns of precipitation, and all of those things sort of exacerbate uh, what we'll talk about as climate-sensitive infectious diseases. But they also exacerbate one another. So in situations where we have you know, a warming climate and a reduction in precipitation, that can contribute to additional deforestation as we look to find new places to grow crops because places where we've previously grown them are no longer really hospitable to be able to do so. So populations of humans and animals really are under significant pressure as a result of climate change that really exacerbates climate sensitive infectious diseases. And when we talk about climate sensitive infectious diseases, I really think about them as, as kind of falling into four major groups. So the first group are like the vector borne diseases and these are arthropod uh, transmitted pathogens. So pathogens that are transmitted by mosquitoes and ticks and climate and changing climate is going to see us uh, start to observe, if we are not already observing them, increases in things like West Nile virus and Lyme disease as a function of changing climate. We're going to talk a little bit about the mechanisms. What we also will start to see is um, you know, tick-borne endemic diseases in the U.S., for instance, starting to be detected in Canada as some of those vectors are able to expand their range northward as a result of changing climate. Again, we'll talk a little bit about the mechanisms of that. We also know that in some places, we might expect to see tropical or subtropical infection disease, infectious diseases that are transmitted by vectors start to occur in places where they haven't been before because the vectors necessary to transmit them have not been able to survive in cold climates and then may start to be able to establish local populations which are sufficient for local transmission. And we've seen that in parts of the US like Florida and Texas where cases of uh, Zika virus and dengue, uh, upwards of 200 locally acquired cases have been documented. The second group of climate sensitive diseases are ones that are directly transmitted zoonoses. So these are pathogens that are transmitted between animals and humans, and also from humans to animals. It's important that we recognize that they can go back and forth. Um, pathogens that are transmitted by animals as a result of changes in their population dynamics. We know that climate, temperature, and precipitation patterns directly influence the survival of some of these populations, especially rodents, and that it can cause kind of these boom and bust cycles of small rodents, which can uh, change the way in which they interact with human populations. Weather patterns cause these changes, which results in geographic and temporal patterns of zoonoses like rabies and brucellosis changing in ways that we haven't seen. We also know that it will likely also result in the observation of pathogens that have not been common in Canada previously, like hantavirus, potentially uh, becoming pathogens that we see more commonly. The third group of climate sensitive pathogens are those with kind of an environmental component. So these would be pathogens where, you know, changes in temperature or precipitation increase the survival and reproduction of the pathogen in the environment. And we might think about things like fungal uh, pathogens in soil. We also might think about something like Legionella. Legionella uh, causes illness in people. And as we see increased um, extreme heat events and rely on more air conditioning, for instance, we might expect to see increasing kind of growth of Legionella within some of these systems, which then is associated with outbreaks. The last one is kind of this broad group of, of pathogens that we call emerging infectious diseases. And these are really the ones that are a function of, um, when I think about them, I think about them more as kind of the spillover types of pathogens. And the next panel uh, discussion on this in a few weeks is going to be specifically focused on spillover. So today I'm not gonna talk a lot about spillover dynamics, except to say that, you know, the ecology of these systems is changing globally. And that with that, we will likely see continued emergence of novel pathogens around the world 
And with increased mobility of humans, uh, we will expect to see increased global spread of pathogens and the associated epidemics and pandemics. I'm gonna give you a little bit of a case study here because I think that West Nile virus is a really great um, system to think about a lot of these different components. So West Nile virus is a pathogen that you know, has been in Canada for quite some time. We know that kind of the, the main component of the disease dynamic is this dynamic between wild bird hosts and the mosquitoes, which are the vector that act to transmit the pathogen between wild birds. And when we think about wild birds and we think about mosquito vectors, we know that there are abiotic and biotic components of their environment that contribute to the ways in which the pathogen is spread, the rate at which it is spread. That includes things like climate, water availability, land use, as well as kind of the biotic components comprised of things like the community composition of the birds themselves within a local area and the way in which the mosquitoes interact with humans um, as a result of kind of different ways in which the land is used. So I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about a part of this, which is the wild bird piece. You know, West Wild virus affects birds, um, which is not surprising, and it's transferred to humans by the mosquitoes. But the virus itself is an important threat to bird populations. In fact, many bird species um, will die as a result of their West Nile virus infection. And over 300 species are able to act as hosts. So you have kind of this constellation of all different sorts of birds. Um, and we know that more diverse bird populations, so places where you have lots of different species of birds, can help to buffer against infection. Studies have really shown that high bird diversity is linked with a lower incidence of disease in humans. And we've seen this in other sorts of pathogens and it's been called the dilution effect and it's been demonstrated also with Lyme disease. When you kind of reduce the uh, biodiversity of the community, you create this kind of amplification. So when you maintain high biodiversity, you dilute, um, dilute out some of the pathogen effect. And this is really important because West Nile virus is really a significant economic burden. Uh, in 2002, which is a long time ago, it was estimated that it cost the US healthcare system $200 million, um, which really highlights the increasing evidence for economically valuable ecosystem services provided by biodiversity. Having lots of different types of birds acts in a way that helps to protect human health. But West Nile virus doesn't just depend on bird diversity. It also requires mosquitoes. And we talked a little bit about the fact that weather patterns play an important role in the population dynamics of mosquitoes. Warmer temperatures and water availability allow mosquitoes to reproduce more quickly and allows them to survive for longer. So what you end up with are larger populations that are around for longer, which creates more and more opportunities for transmission to occur. We also know that under a warming climate, for some pathogens, it also causes a more rapid development of the pathogen in the mosquito itself. And we call that the extrinsic incubation period, which means that the mosquitoes become infectious to others more quickly than they would under uh, a different climatic kind of uh, profile. We also know that range expansion is a huge issue, and we've seen this with ticks and it's also important for mosquitoes. So this is a figure from a paper that looked at the Canadian prairies. And under the current, current projection of um, West Nile virus infection rates, we can see that you know, risk of West Nile virus infection was predominantly concentrated in the southern part of the prairies, and it was quite low, between zero and five per thousand population. And what they did is they looked at these three different scenarios, cool and wet, kind of an in-between scenario, and then warm and dry, and looked at three different time periods looking forward in the future. And what we can see is that even in you know, this early time period, which was 2010 to 2039, which is not that long from now, we see significant changes along this southern edge with increasing um, rates of West Nile virus being predicted. And as you get into 2040 in kind of two of the three scenarios, 
you start to see quite high rates of West Nile virus being predicted across that southern uh, edge as a result of changing climate. And this is important because it means that climate change shifts vulnerability to disease depending on your geography. This is a figure from the Canadian Drought Monitor, which you know, is probably not surprising to a lot of people that many parts of Canada, including the prairie provinces that we were just talking about, are experiencing drought. And a lot of times we don't, you know, we just talked about mosquitoes and water and temperature and how that was associated with risk of vector-borne diseases. And what we might not think of is that drought is also associated with an increased risk of vector-borne disease. So what happens, and we've seen this in the US in 1999, there was a large outbreak of West Nile virus that was associated with drought. And we would think, well, you know, if water is required for mosquito breeding, like what happens? How does that work? And it turns out that when you have extreme drought or even a small amount of drought, moving water becomes stagnant. You start to have the moving water dry up and you're left with small pools of stagnant water. So you create the perfect breeding ground for mosquitoes and on top of that, the drought kills off any sort of mosquito predators that would otherwise have survived if the water were still moving. And so in the US, there was an outbreak of West Nile virus associated with drought, which is a little bit different, kind of non uh, counterintuitive to what we typically think of when we think about, you know, water and mosquitoes. We also know that climate is driving extreme weather events. You know, we've seen this early onset and extreme onset of the fire season in the Western Canada. And we know that, you know, we think about extreme weather events and we think about climate sensitive infectious diseases, but it's also important for us to remember that climate impacts our ability to deliver public health and our ability to deliver healthcare in general. It impacts supply chains. It destroys infrastructure and buildings if we have significant flooding and that's required for health and safety like medical facilities. It creates problems for our ability to provide safe water to drink, to provide electricity, to keep food from spoiling and to keep vaccines at the proper temperature to remain effective when you have individuals you know, going to get their vaccines. So the indirect effects of extreme weather events for infectious disease prevention and control are much more widespread than just you know, the disease dynamics themselves. I would be remiss to talk about climate and infectious diseases without mentioning the social determinants of health. We know that vulnerability to infectious disease health risks related to climate change is complex. And it's you know, determined by a bunch of different factors that act to influence an individual's exposure, their sensitivity and their adaptive capacity. And each of those kind of black arrows in the figure are influenced by social determinants of health, poverty, racial discrimination, underlying health disparities, all of these things that we know are important. And while all Canadians are going to be vulnerable and are vulnerable to climate change, the experiences of impacts and risks are not uniform. And some individuals and communities will be disproportionately affected. And it's important for us to ensure that when we are thinking proactively about climate and health action, that we are really paying close attention to the equity piece of this. You know, Canada has a robust public health system and we have, you know, a lot of great public health uh, action. You know, we've seen outbreak response uh, in real time uh, working, you know, pretty well. And it, you know, public health allows us to think about, you know, preparedness and surveillance and monitoring and outbreak response. And I would argue that more recently, we also have been thinking a lot about upstream preparedness. So how do we use data to help contribute to modeling to help us identify, you know, which pathogens are climate sensitive? How will that climate sensitivity impact human health? Can we use those models to make predictions about where these uh, changes or emergences or spread will happen? And can we be proactive about getting there first instead of responding in kind of an outbreak response fashion? Can we figure out where it will happen and then intervene before we see having to move into that outbreak response period?
as infectious disease risks continue to grow in a changing climate, these activities, both the outbreak response and the upstream preparedness, become increasingly important for our adaptation uh, efforts to be successful. And it is going to require sufficient funding to make that happen. So in conclusion, I just want to say that you know, I think our current approach to climate and infectious disease is not really optimal. It's not optimal when we use an outbreak response framework. It's not optimal to say, you know, we're going to wait for the pathogen to show up and then, you know, we're going to hope that we catch it early and then we're going to hope that we have the resources and the structures in place to be able to contain. I think that that is really a highly, you know, siloed and kind of reductionist approach. And it works great for very specific problems. But I think climate and infectious disease and environment is much more challenging. I think that primary prevention has to be what we focus on because it will be the most impactful. We have to work upstream. You have to think about climate and health and environmental policy kind of together. Many of the challenges that we are faced with in terms of climate and infectious disease are ones that are also being faced by other disciplines. You know, many other sectors are challenging, are, are faced with the same challenges like agriculture, um, both in terms of crops and in terms of animals and livestock, uh, environment and natural resources, where we might see, you know, different sorts of species invasions. All of these disciplines are challenged with the same struggles and trying to think about how to um, bring together the skills and the tools in a way that allows us to really leverage uh, the expertise across these different disciplines, which I would argue really roots our response in kind of a robust One Health approach, which provides advantages over kind of this otherwise siloed management of sector specific risks. Um, it's not the sort of work that a small group of people can kind of do off the side of their desk. Um, we need systematic collaboration between a lot of different disciplines that historically have maybe not worked together or talked to one another um, when we think about these issues moving forward. And so on that note, I'm going to wrap up and hopefully I've set the stage sufficiently that we can have a conversation about the next steps and where we're at. I think you, I think you've done so very very ably. Thank you for an excellent presentation. Um, next, I would like to introduce our moderator for today's panel discussion. Uh, we're joined by Kate Allen. Kate is a reporter for the Toronto Star who writes about climate change and the environment. She's been reporting on science for more than 10 years, has covered the COVID-19 pandemic beginning in January 2020, um, and her work has been nominated for, for numerous journalism awards. And we're very, very lucky to have her with us. So welcome, Kate. Thank you, David. Um, and thank you, Amy, so much for that fascinating presentation. I always learn so much every time I uh, talk to you or hear from you. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, as David mentioned, my name is Kate Allen, and I'm a climate change reporter uh, for the Toronto Star. Um, we are very lucky to have a panel with so much expertise today, so let me introduce you to our two other panelists before we dive into a, a discussion of some of the issues that Amy raised in her talk. Um, and just a reminder to uh, feel free to drop any questions into the Q&A box, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Um, okay, so you've met Amy, you've met David. We are also lucky to have uh, Cameron Kahn with us today. Cameron is an uh, a practicing infectious disease physician um, and a professor of medicine and public health at the University of Toronto, where he holds a Temergy Health Nexus Chair in Innovation and Technology. Motivated by his experiences as a frontline healthcare worker during the 2003 Toronto SARS outbreak, he has been studying outbreaks of emerging and re-emerging pathogens for nearly two decades to lay the scientific foundation for a global early warning system for infectious diseases. His work during the global health emergencies, uh, uh, including the 2014 Ebola epidemic in West Africa and the 2016 Zika epi epidemic in Latin America, um, led him into numerous advisory roles for the World Health Organization, um, and uh, including the White House. 
We also have Jeff Anderson. Jeff is a professor at the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto. His research is focused on health outcomes in high needs and vulnerable populations, and he has extensive experience uh, in international comparisons of health policy and outcomes. He has acted as an advisor to federal and provincial governments on research and its impact. Um, he has a PhD in public policy analysis from the RAND Graduate Institute, an MSc in community medicine from the University of Toronto, and an MD from the University of Ottawa. So thank you all so much for being with us today. Um, Cameron, I thought I would start with you because as, as everybody can see, you're, you just came from clinic and I, it seems like you're still there. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you, um, we've just heard from Amy about some of the ways that climate change is impacting infectious diseases and that's uh, some of them are, or a lot of them are complex um, and uh, indirect, but are there tangible ways that climate change is affecting your patient population and your work that you are already noticing? Uh, well, first of all, Kate, okay, thanks for uh, for the introduction and, and really uh, appreciate being uh, able to participate in, in this webinar with uh, with everyone today. Um, maybe I'll just start out for context. Yes, I am still in clinic. Often <laughs> clinics run a little bit long, so uh, I wasn't able to to make it out of the clinic uh, this morning. But um, just for a little bit of context, the, the practice that I'm in right now is one where I'm primarily uh, interacting with newcomers to Canada, uh, immigrants and refugees from around the world, um, and primarily treating uh, them with a variety of infections, including things like tuberculosis and other types of global infectious diseases. I've been in this practice now for about 20 years, so I've had some uh, a time period to be able to, to kind of evaluate how things have, have changed. Now, what I will say is most of the, if I'm thinking of refugees that I see, and there, there are quite a few who are, you know, um, uh, fleeing areas of conflict around the world and resettling here in Canada. They've been displaced from their homes and, uh, and they're being re resettled based on humanitarian grounds. Now, at this point in time, I would say in my practice, I'm not necessarily seeing any very, you know, very direct links to, um, climate change that is leading to the you know displacement of people that are being resettled on human on a humanitarian basis um but i do think as we look forward i do think that the relationship between climate change and conflict is going to be something that we see more of going forward and i suspect that we will see as resources start to uh become more scarce uh, I suspect we will see more conflict, which then leads to displacement of populations and, and ultimately uh, a resettlement of, of people into, into different parts of the world, including into Canada. So I would say at this point in time, I haven't really seen a very direct relationship between climate change and the patient population that I'm managing today, but maybe in more subtle and indirect ways. But I do anticipate that this is something that we will, this is a challenge that we will be facing more of uh, in the years ahead. And just to drill down into that a little bit, can you elaborate on the links between displacement and resettlement and infectious diseases? Like how do those um, interact? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I would say kind of in my, you know, 20 years or so in practice, I've seen really two key factors that motivate migration. It's either that there is an economic gradient, if you will, in the, in the countries of origin of, uh, of newcomers to Canada and, and, of course, where we are here in Canada. So people are motivated by new opportunities for prosperity, to build a better life for themselves and their families. Um, and so, you know, that's actually very similar to my own personal story of, of my family immigrating to Canada. On the other hand... I also see acute events that happen in the world, usually again related to conflict, which displace people either internally within their own countries or into a neighboring country. And then they are ultimately, um, you know, forced to, to resettle because of, you know, they have a, uh, a, a threats to their health and their safety if they return back to their home country. Now, the reason why this affects us from an infectious disease standpoint or why it's pertinent here is I think Amy was talking a little bit about reservoirs of various microbes. In some cases, they're animal reservoirs, but there are many diseases where humans actually can carry the microbe uh, latently or dormantly for, for years, if not decades. So the clinic I'm in today 
you know, I've been treating patients with tuberculosis and many of them may have been exposed uh, in another part of the world. And years or even decades later, uh, that microbe can manifest itself and then create a, a health risk uh, here within Canada. There are other things, you know, viral hepatitis, parasites, and others that can persist for, for a significant period of time. So as we see these shifts in human migration, there are also these epidemiological shifts in the burden of infectious diseases. And then as, as we think about the health systems and the responses, we've got to be able to adapt to conditions that maybe healthcare providers lack familiarity with, they're not used to recognizing them. Um, they may not have necessarily the skills or training or experience in managing cross-cultural issues. So there can be a whole bunch of important challenges that arise when you've got uh, significant shifts in, um, uh, in population demographics as a result of migration. Gotcha, thank you. That is um, interesting and uh, worrying. Um, David, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, um, but I did have another question for you uh, about modeling. Um, but feel free to, sure. to answer that as well. Oh, no, I, I think Cam's right on in terms of, um, I, I, I think people like myself and Amy, I, I mean, Amy and I co-wrote an article for CMAJ in 2009 called Climate Change and Infectious Diseases, The Road Ahead. And it's, you know, it's pretty accurate in terms of predicting what's going to happen. And it seems like that's kind of a cool party trick. Like, how did you know? And the, 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 the fact is, it's not that hard to see this stuff, right? This is not, this is not, I mean, some of these relationships are complex, but on the whole, this stuff is not rocket science. We know vector biting rates are, are a function of nighttime temperature. We know reproduction numbers of infectious diseases spread by vectors are a function of vector biting rates. So, you know, you, you turn up the temperature, what's going to happen? We, we know that if you increase the range of vectors, because you, you increase, you know, when I, when I graduated med school in 1994, we, we, the only place we officially had Lyme disease in Canada was Point Pelee. <laughs> and at this point, I mean, we've had disease spread by the same ticks as far north as Calgary. I know we had a human granulocytic ehrlichiosis case in Calgary about a decade ago. So a lot of this stuff is simply range expansion. It's highly predictable. We talked about what's going to happen with endemic fungal diseases, that those are likely to change they have. So a lot of this stuff is entirely predictable. Um, to Cam's point, though, which I think is spot on. We know that what is worst for communicable diseases and infectious diseases on a global level is economic disruption and movement of populations, migration of populations, wars and play go together. And we, we see that repeatedly. We, you know, we've just seen that with Ebola resurgence in Congo with, with civil conflict. It happens again and again and again. And what I sort of popped into the chat there was these relationships are actually already pretty well established. There's an article from about 10 years ago by an economist named Solomon Sang at Stanford, I believe, looking at El Nino as a model for climate change. So El Nino is an irregular climatic phenomenon that creates changes in rainfall and drought that sort of are similar to what we anticipate happening with climate change. And what you see is when water becomes scarce, people fight. And when people fight, people get displaced. And when people lose farmland, people get displaced. Um, and, and you know, I mean, CAMS in TB clinic, um, you know that there have been a lot of great plagues and great die-offs of, of human populations associated with war and economic disruption. And that, I think, is ultimately going to be the biggest impact of climate change on, on infectious and communicable diseases is going to be the disruption of populations and global migration and, and creation of climate refugees. Yeah. Well, that kind of answers my question, but I still want to ask it um, because something I uh, hear in my, on my beat all the time is from so many different sources, like from agriculture people, from, you know, land and housing people is that uh, climate change is in, injecting so much uncertainty um, into the future. And we know things are going to change, but we don't know exactly how. 
Um, and we just, we don't know the specifics and it's, you know, impossible to I, predict. I don't think that's true. I think that the physics of this is pretty clear. All that's been happening with the IPCC guidelines over the last 30 years is the confidence intervals have been getting tighter and tighter. They were saying the same thing in, in the er, you know, early 2000s, late 1990s, as they're saying now, it's just you've got <laughs> tighter confidence intervals around the predictions. I actually, sorry to drag things over to COVID because everyone hates COVID, but we just actually had something come out yesterday, uh, an editorial in, in PNAS the, that I wrote, I guess it's not we, uh, Royal We. I, I had an editorial come out in PNAS there was a commentary on a modeling study that there's a, a U.S. modeling consortium called Midas, which is a bunch of groups at different universities who kind of got press ganged into service by the U.S. CDC in May 2020 around reopening after you know public health restrictions were imposed. How should we reopen? And what's interesting is you got 12 or 15 groups in terms of rank ordering of strategies to protect population health, there's so much uncertainty still. I mean, you remember May 2020, there's so many things that we know now that we didn't know then, didn't matter. All of the groups come up with the same rank ordering of strategies. And the point that I tried to make in, in the editorial is that scientists, which I'll include myself, be generous, include myself, but scientists, when they talk about policy, tend to be very focused on scientific uncertainty, right? Oh, if we only had perfect information, we'd make the right decisions. There's a guy named Roger Pilkey who writes about climate change, actually kind of from the opposite side of where I sit. He's a political scientist, and I think he made an incredibly astute point. He's got a book called The Honest Broker about decision-making in science. And the point Pilkey makes is scientists talk about policy as being based on a single dimension, scientific uncertainty, the right decisions. If we're uncertain, it's harder. And his point is, no, there are actually two dimensions. One is scientific uncertainty, and the other is values, and values consensus. And he makes the point that if we don't have scientific uncertainty, if folks have values positions that are at odds with each other, it may be to their benefit to create uncertainty potentially pseudo uncertainty, because to use his words, that creates space for negotiation on policy. And I think that's very much what we're seeing. I think our problem fundamentally with climate change is time horizon. We don't want to do big things now because they're going to pay off in 30 years. You know, human beings have strong time preferences. We want our, you know, we all fail the marshmallow test. We want our marshmallows now. We don't want to wait and get two marshmallows in 30 years. And that's problematic when you're dealing with a mega issue like climate change, where we actually have to do big stuff that's disruptive now in order <laughs> to have our kids and grandkids not have to foot the bill. So there's stuff that, you know, there've been papers, it's not my area, there are papers written about sea level rise, the importance of investing now, return on investment in 50 years or 100 years. There's a massive return on investment in terms of making coastal cities uh, climate resilient, flood resilient, resilient to rising sea levels. That's out there. That's written. We can do the same stuff with climate change. The difficulty is that when that hits the policy sausage maker, there are a lot of folks who are not going to like to do things in the short term that are disruptive, that impact you know their businesses, that impact how they make their money to, to solve a problem that's going to be 30 years from now. And I think that's fundamentally what it comes down to is we've got values disconnects in terms of, you know, do it now, do it later. Um, uh, and, 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 and who's, who's, whose wallet is going to get hit. Mm -hmm. I have, I have a question. Um, I could talk all day about uncertainty. Um, um, but in the interest of time, I have a question for Jeff and then I have an audience question. I'm going to start with um, Amy, unless Amy, you have anything you want to add first to anything that's been said so far. Or yeah, I wanted to follow up just on David's comment, because that was one of the things I wanted to say, you know, I put together my talk and, and I put it together fresh this week. And then to be honest, I thought to myself, boy, I feel like I gave this exact same talk in 2007. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think we can't use more data and less uncertainty as a continued excuse to not act. Like, I, I think we're 
we're at the point where, you know, I love data, I love models, I love to do research, but I think we know a lot. Like, I don't think that we can continue to just say more data, more surveillance, less uncertainty, and then we'll decide what to do. Like, I think we know what we need to do is just tough to do it. Yeah. Okay. I want to come back to that. Um, first though, Jeff, um, so we know that the impacts of climate change are not being felt equally. Um, and we also know that the impacts of infectious diseases, including this pandemic, are not equal. Um, can you talk a little bit about how those inequalities overlap? And, you know, do they just overlap or do they, for lack of a better term, supercharge each other? Well, thanks, Amy, for, for the question. And let me provide a little context at the beginning, if you don't mind. So I think it'll, it'll help set this in a bit, bit more... Uh, clear what I'm trying to get across. So the, the slide that Amy started with listed climate change, pandemic risk, and population health as related topics. And my entry into this uh, panel was originally on sort of the climate change side. So uh, I work on sort of a climate positive healthcare and a resilient healthcare system. And that's my link to the climate positive energy partners in this. I'm also uh, part of the Institute for Pandemics. Uh, like David, I lead one of the themes there. And the theme I lead is recovery, and that recovery has a real focus on inequities. And that leads me to the, the third theme, which is population health. And uh, I'm trying to set this up by saying that the biggest question in population health, the one that is that is being plaguing us for the last 30 years, and is the one simple question is why some people are healthy and some are not. And it's really interesting to look at the history of the thinking about that, that a lot of the really innovative thinking about this came from Canadians, Bob Evans in particular out in BC. I was lucky enough to work with him in the last century and more recently with, with, with John Frank. So the question about why some people are healthy and others are not is really fundamentally linked to this issue of what, what creates health. And one of the first principles that those folks came up with is that uh, it's the importance of context. So, the individual characteristics of people are really important. Your genome is important. Your gut biome is important. But what's really, I think, really important is your context, where you live, your social context, your economic context, your cultural context. Those have a huge impact on health. So that's kind of the first principle, right? The idea that there's something more than the individual, something more in your genome and your biome that, that causes health. It's your context. And this is going to get us into this notion of, of inequity. So that sort of a, as you start to think about that, you realize that the, the interplay between the specific characteristics like the virus and the individual and the community is complicated. But that this context is really, really important. That the notion that some people are healthy and others are not is in large part, the inequities are in large part driven by social inequities. Like I come from a very privileged background. I, you know, I wouldn't have gotten all that education if you listed if I didn't come from a privileged background. But I'm really interested in this fundamental question of why, you know, what is the interaction between that? And, and one thing I can tell you with certainty is that the, um, virtually every disease that we look at, there's always a gradient. The people that are disadvantaged socially and materially always do worse. And you can see that with climate change. I mean, it's obvious when you think about the impacts of climate change and heat and smoke, it affects poor people more than rich people. It affects people that live in poor housing more than people that live in, in good housing. The pandemic played out in spades for that. I'm sure you, Kate, that was one of the big themes is, oh my gosh, this isn't affecting people equally. It's not like a virus that doesn't treat people different. It treated people hugely different, right? The outcomes were hugely differently across us. So, so the notion uh, around this is the idea that fundamental to these health inequities and to people's health is the notion of their social and, and environment, you know, where they sit in society. So this also leads to something that I think is important for us to think about. Amy mentioned upstream effects. I think the fundamental upstream thing that we need to look at is making our society resilient by addressing those issues around social inequities, you know, material and social deprivation, making sure people have jobs, they live in, in safe places, they are able to get social support. So 
you know, I think the, the common lens for all pandemics is inequities. And to get back to your question about the compounding effect, this is like the worst thing you can imagine for, for poor people. The climate change isn't caused by them. They didn't produce most of the carbon, right? But the impact is on them. So, so that those are the people who are going to get affected. And the same thing is going to happen with the pandemics that come out of climate change. It's going to affect poor people more than it's going to affect rich people. It's going to affect isolated people more than integrated people. So that's my main concern. I think that's the thing that keeps me up at night is like, we got to, we got to start thinking of the cause of causes around these things. I, I get the, you know, I get the point is there's insects biting people, but the, the bigger context is the environment that we all live. In. So uh, I hope that addresses your question. It was a bit of a polemic, but. No, it, it does. Yeah. And one thing I noticed when I uh, moved from the pandemic beat to the climate change beat is that I was basically on the same beat. I just switched global crises. <laughs> like yeah. So much of it was, was so many of the themes were the same. Um, yeah, which is a distressing realization. Um, I want to get to some audience questions just because I'm I've got my eye on the clock. Um, and Amy, I think you'd be a great person to tackle this first. Uh, Tegan asks, how can we position communities that are often neglected in a one health approach to be more conscious about climate change or climate changes? Maybe also, I can't remember if we have given a definition for one health yet. So maybe just like the briefest of definitions for one health. Yeah, okay. So, so I mean, in general, I mean, sure, there are lots of definitions of one health, but I think broadly what we're talking about is an understanding of the fact that there is interconnectedness, that we can't really treat human infectious diseases without thinking about, you know, the animal uh, and kind of agricultural setting. We can't think about the environment, that, that really the complexity comes from the interface of all of those different pieces. Um, and there's no simple kind of solution, right? Because the, the pot is very muddy in the middle because there's so many different things. And we also know that the interactions between all of those cause feedback loops, right? So, so you also have this situation where it's not as simple as like one thing goes up and the next thing also goes up or one thing goes up and one thing goes down that you have kind of these dynamics that are messy, right? Like they're very, very messy. It's not straightforward. In terms of uh, Tegan's question, which was about, um, oh, Tegan has multiple Do you want me to read it again? It, dis it disappeared. Yeah, yes. yeah that's okay. It, it's how can we position communities that are often neglected in a one health approach to be more conscious about climate changes? Yeah, I think that one of the things is that um, we need to engage people in local communities. Like I do think that there is, um, you know, we kind of have been using this top down approach whereby we try to think like at this high level, how do we get all of these big players together and get them to, you know, work together to come up with policies and plans. And then we can kind of like put those on top of people and say, here's what you will do. Because there's really no one size fits all solution is that there are going to be local solutions for some communities. And so I think that, you know, this is where I think that it's hard to do off the side of your desk becomes a problem because in order to build interactions with the communities that are most at risk, you have to build a relationship with them. You have to build trust. You have to spend time getting to understand what their needs are. Um, and it's not the sort of thing that we can just do in a very short period of time. Uh, it's going to take time to do that. And so I think that that's one of the things is that we need to listen. We need to identify where um, communities are facing some of these most kind of time sensitive and pressing issues and ask them what they need. Because I think that we've kind of been working from this, you know, scenario where we, we try to just come up with a one size fits all solution and apply it to, you know, smaller locations or smaller communities. And I don't really think that that works. But the problem is that the other way of doing it takes time. And so we have to have dedicated resources to allow those um, interactions and those collaborations 
to start to, to be able to build. And I've seen that term like lateral public health, right? So, so public mm-hmm. health that kind of reaches out into their local community to really kind of spread uh, across the local community instead of this kind of up and down vertical structure. Yeah, I think about this um, in my day to day job, like all the time, because people just simply cannot attach to things that are happening so far above their daily lives. Like all that stuff is incredibly important. And like I've, you know, been to UN COPS and things like that. But, um, you know, to to for people to to feel like they have um, uh, a stake um, in the outcome, you, you have to make it relevant to their lives. So, but it's it's hard to do sometimes, at least I find it hard to do. <laughs> um, I don't know if people have um, responses to that as well, but I'm also going to throw out another audience question because we're getting uh, close to the end of our time, uh, which is what models are currently being used to forecast the future public health threat slash risk environment? I have a feeling uh, a couple people, <laughs> Cameron and David, will probably want to answer that. Maybe Cameron, we haven't heard from you in a while. So do you want to start? Okay, sure. Um, maybe I'll just I'll keep my remarks fairly short because I'm mindful of time. But maybe just I'll share one example of some of the work that we've been doing uh, at Blue Dot, really, and in, in, in taking climate change models and intersecting um, the suitability uh, vectors. And we talked a little bit about the geographic expansion and the range of diseases. You know, I often talk about. Uh, we're going to have to redraw the world's maps. We're going to have to redraw many of the world's infectious disease maps as well in the process. Um, And maybe just tying that a little bit to, you know, we've talked about insights and then then action in relation to that. And action can be a challenge for some of the reasons. I think David spoke nicely about how humans discount the significance of future events relative to present-day events. And so things that are happening a decade or decades into the future may be less relevant. So that time horizon becomes quite important. I'll just share one example of how at Blue Dot we've been working with industry and speaking about time horizon where pharma and life sciences companies are thinking about, well, what kind of vaccines and therapeutics and so forth do we need to be developing? But the time horizon they're operating in are in years, maybe even up to you know a decade or so. And so when we think about some of these models and insights about what is the landscape of, what are we anticipating the landscape of some of these diseases will look like? What will that burden of disease look like in the future? Um, And I guess from the private sector's perspective, it's also what is the total addressable market? I hate to sort of bring it down to the economics, but at the end of the day, you know, what, what kind of impact could they potentially have? What's the size of the addressable market? And so in, in some of those situations, it really helps some of these organizations and companies decide what types of vaccines and therapeutics and molecules and so forth should they, they should be pushing through the research and development pipeline, ultimately, so that maybe we, we come to a place where we have medical countermeasures that are able to um, be utilized for uh, infectious diseases that we are, you know, we're going to be encountering in a, in a very different way, say in five or 10 years from now. So that's just a, a one example of how, you know, we've been intersecting some of the climate models with infectious disease, um, uh, vector borne disease, uh, uh, geographic ranges and so forth, and using that to inform not just public sector decisions, but actually interfacing directly with the private sector. Um, thank you. And because we only have four minutes left, I want to do a lightning round um, with this question that was submitted in advance that I like. This is a very journalisty question. Um, what public health risks from climate change keep you up at night? Everybody gets a minute. <laughs> I don't know, David, do you want to start? Sure. I, I mean, for me, it's it's really um, less about communicable diseases and infectious diseases specifically than it is about social disruption. Um, I, I, I don't think that people really get what we're talking about here over um, the next couple of decades in terms of a substantial global rise in temperature. I, I, I think it's it, it will create tremendous chaos, tremendous discord and tremendous conflict. Uh, communicable diseases and infectious diseases will be part of that but uh, it's much bigger than communicable and infectious diseases. Um, Jeff, did you wanna? I'll just pick up on what I think David 
just said is that my sense is that the inequities that are going to be driven by this, like who gets sick, who is hit by climate change, is going to drive this conflict. And we can only uh, see inequities growing and growing, and equities are going to be a cause of conflict. And I think we just need to start to deal with this root cause stuff about dealing with social inequities. Cameron? Yes, I'll just go back to mass migration events, and it really picks up on David's point about social disruption. You know, I think I've had the experience over years of seeing uh, conflicts that have happened around the world and what some of the implications are. And we're, we're in a pretty privileged environment here in Canada where we're kind of surrounded by uh, oceans and we've got, you know, the, uh, the U.S. south of the border. But if we happen to be in a, in a European country and we had, you know, millions of people uh, uh, moving because of conflict, that creates an enormous amount of disruption. And certainly from a health perspective, um, you know, most of our healthcare systems are barely functioning after the last few years of this pandemic, uh, let alone have the surge capacity to be able to, to deal with a, a mass migration event. Let's even leave conflict aside just simply because of an environmental disaster, flooding, earthquakes, et cetera. So, I mean, those are the things that I think we're just really not well prepared to, uh, to tackle today. And the last word to our invited speaker, Amy. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think for me, it's it's conflict and it's human suffering, right? Like, I, I think that, you know, nobody wants people to suffer and human suffering is enhanced by all of the inequity that we see in the world. And I really fear that with climate change, you know, that will just continue to grow. And so for me, that's really the part that that keeps me up at night. Yeah. Okay. Thank you everybody so much for your thoughts and your expertise. Um, the next and last uh, of the speaker series is going to be held on June 27th at noon, just like this one. And the topic of that one is climate change and zoonotic spillovers. And our keynote speaker is Dr. Samira Mubarika, and I will be moderating that one as well. So we hope to see you there. Thank you all. Oh, David, I can tell you. How oh, you... no, that's OK. I, I, I think I get the last word for. Oh, you do get the last word. They, 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 yeah, and, and it's to thank you uh, oh. for being a marvelous <laughs> moderator. And, 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 and thanks. Thanks, Amy Greer, for, for a great talk. And thanks to my fellow panelists and uh, to IFP, Climate Positive Energy and, uh, and EPIC and Nelson Lee, who's in the background, and Ted Konya who's in the background, and Saida Masood and Betty Zhu, uh, all, all of the folks who've done such a marvelous job with these seminars and made them happen. And with that, we need to get Kate Allen to her press, press conference. So we must unfortunately end. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.